I'm going to read from the Bible, and my apologies, the call to worship isn't actually coming from Psalm 117 as written, it's coming from Hebrews 12. And this is what it says, I'm reading from verse 22 to 24, and then from verse 28. This is what it says. You have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. Well, that's what we're here to do, is it not? As we gather together as his people, called by him to trust in Jesus, who has sanctified us, set us apart, justified us by his blood through his death on the cross. And all by faith and all as a work of God's grace. How wonderful, how perfect. Let us pray to our God and give him praise. Lord our God, we do thank you and praise you that you are the only living God. And in your might and in your wisdom, you have brought us near to your throne not through works of righteousness that we can do, but only through the blood of Jesus. Only as he suffered and died for our transgression, our rebellion, our rejection of you. Oh yes, Father, we could not choose you by ourselves. Oh, left to ourselves, we would choose to follow our own pathway. Follow the ways of the world around us. Give ourselves over to idols of selfishness and pride and ambition. Oh, but you, Father, you have reached down from your heavenly throne and you have plucked us from the path that we were headed toward as your enemies. And you have redeemed us and brought us into your family, adopted us as sons and daughters, and made us one with Christ, and made us one in Christ. Oh, what a great privilege it is to be before you this day. What reasons, what mighty reasons we have to give you praise, to give you thanks for all the mighty work that you have done for us in Christ. And so, Father, we pray that this day you would be with us and among us. And by the power of the Spirit, you will work in our hearts and minds to help us to know more of who you are and what you have done and what you are doing. As you transform us into the image of Christ through the hearing of your word. O oh Lord our God, continue to bless this people. Continue to draw us to Christ and draw us to one another. Forgive us, Father, for we know that even as we seek to honour and praise and give thanks to you, yet we fall far short of perfection. We do tend to fall back into old patterns. We do tend to wander astray from obedience to your word. We do tend to want to do things our own way, for our own ambition for our own pride for our own reasons but we confess this before you knowing that you are faithful and just and will forgive us because christ paid the price and we thank you for that and we thank you that we have that promise of forgiveness and so help us to turn from our sin even as we repent of it to live lives that Bring honour and glory to your name, lives of obedience, as we listen and do your word. O oh Lord our God, help us 
to especially act in ways that are in accordance with your love for us, such that we might show love for you and love for each other. O oh Lord, may this be the centerpiece of our life and our goal and expectation, for it brings you glory. O oh Lord, our God, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing our first song. It's number 91 in your hymn books. Come now, almighty King. Lord our God, we do thank you and praise you for the power of your word. A power that can transform hearts and minds to seek you out and to find you through the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the witness and the work of the Gideons, those here present and those around the world who have been active in spreading the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ to our communities, especially to our schools, hospitals and prisons and hotels. We ask, Father, that you will continue to strengthen their hand, continue to build the work of the Gideons. And we ask, Father, that you would also help us to partner with them. That the work would not stumble. That whatever opposition is presented could be flattened. That doors would continue to be opened so that your word might go out. That people might read it and be transformed by it. O oh Lord our God, we ask you to sustain those here present, Paul and Peter and the others who have gathered with them sustain their wives and their families and continue to make them bold as they share the word of God. Make us bold too as we also have the responsibility to witness to the Lord Jesus Christ in our daily lives with the people that we know and are in contact with. And in this way, Father, may your kingdom grow. For we long to see people brought into your kingdom, brought to salvation, so that your name will be glorified and honoured by many. We ask these things in Jesus. 
Amen. Uh, we are going to sing again. Number 474, Rise Up, You Saints of God, in your hymn books. turning first to the book of well, Samuel, we're, we're, we're staying in Samuel I should say, uh, we're turning first to 1 Samuel 12 and for our visitors we've been travelling through the book of Samuel at quite a rapid pace, uh, touching on some of the highlights and the lowlights of the book of Samuel uh, and today we're looking at one of the lowlights but I first want to read from 1 Samuel 12 and verse 19 through to 25. And then later we'll be turning over to chapter 15. But first let's read from 1 Samuel 12, verse 19. I think the page numbers are right, page 272 in your Bibles. Let us hear the word of God. And all the people said to Samuel, Pray for your servants to the Lord your God that we may not die. For we have added to all our sins this evil to ask for ourselves a king. And Samuel said to the people, do not be afraid. You have done this, all this evil. Yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they are empty. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, and I will instruct you in the good and right way. Only fear the Lord, and serve him faithfully with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. Uh, 1 Samuel 12. Well, I'm going to pray for us uh, as we pray for the needs of our church and our community. Would you join your hearts with me in prayer once more? Let's pray. Lord our God, as we come before you, we thank you and praise you for the great blessing that it is to be brought together, to know you, to know Christ. What wonderful privilege we have. What a wonderful blessing it is. Let us not count it as something light, but let us see it for what it is, your grace that is active in our lives. We thank you, Father, for the way you have watched over and cared for and provided for this, your people, in this place. But we ask for you to continue to watch over and provide for us as we look to the future. 
as we look to see where you might have us placed, as we look for a permanent place where we can be a presence amongst the community. Oh Lord our God, go before us. Make the pathway clear. Give us wise and discerning minds that we might see where it is the need is most, where we can be of most use to your kingdom. And then invigorate us by your spirit to do the work of reaching out to our community, of speaking to those who don't know you, of encouraging them to seek you out, of speaking about you through your word. And in this way, Father, may your kingdom continue to grow on earth. But also strengthen us as we seek to live faithful and obedient lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. That even through our lives together we may bear witness to the love that he has shown us. That we may bear witness to the salvation that he has offered us. That we may bear witness to your sovereign rule over us. Oh Lord God, we do pray for those who are faithful in their following of Christ. But those who have been made weak through ill health. And we ask God for your blessing to continue to be upon them. We do especially bring Bill Cole before you. We do especially bring Jan before you as well as she cares for her husband. And we ask that they would continue to bear faithful witness to Christ as they have been doing. But strengthen them in the heartache and in the struggle that is theirs. Give us opportunities to help and serve them and show our love for them, even the love of Christ. And we pray that for all those who know periods of grief or sorrow or illness in their lives, we ask that we could be those who get alongside of them. We pray especially for Merle this day and for Dorothy as well as they continue to grieve the death of their husbands. We ask, Father, that you would strengthen them in their faith, but also that you would watch over and comfort them, even as you use us to love them with the love of Christ. And may that be true uh, for each of us in whatever situation we find ourselves. Those who are facing anxiety or depression or other challenges in their life, Whether it's for a short time or a long time, Father, may we be those who get alongside of them. May we watch out for those who are lonely, for those who need help. May we be ready and willing to sit with them, to speak with them, to love them. Lord our God, we know that there is so much loneliness, anxiety and depression and fear in our communities. And we know that Christ can dispel those things through faith in him, through the hope that he offers of eternal life. And so send out workers more and more, including us, to bring the hope of God alive in others. And do a mighty work in this region and in this nation of awakening and enlivening your saints on earth that they would be invigorated and empowered and courageous to go and spread the good news of salvation. And in this way, Father, may we see your spirit active and alive in our communities, transforming hearts and minds as the gospel goes out. Oh Lord, our God, we do pray for those who are suffering for their faith in other nations. We pray for those who are persecuted, whose very lives are in danger because they trust in Jesus. Help them to be steadfast in their love of Christ. But we pray for their persecutors, 
that they would see the foolishness of their ways, that they would hear of the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they would see your power at work in the lives of your saints and be themselves transformed to be followers of Christ, even as you did with Saul of Tarsus. O Lord our God, we pray that you would do these things for us and through us, for we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, We are going to sing again, number 411 in your hymn books, more about Jesus would I know. And we're going to sing the first three verses and their choruses, uh, and then we'll stand and sing. So we'll remain seated for the first three verses and choruses, and we'll stand and sing the last verse and chorus together as the offering is collected. Now, if you're visiting today, please don't feel like you have to contribute uh, to the work of the church here. But if you would like to, we welcome it. Uh, Let us sing more about Jesus, Would I Know, number 411 in the Rejoice Hymn Books. thank you and praise you for the way that you have watched over and provided for us in many ways over the last years continue to provide for us we pray continue to bless us as we look to be good servants of you watching over the things that you have given us with care and diligence that your kingdom might be built that your name might be glorified in this place and every place in which we go. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So open your Bibles once more, and this time to 1 Samuel 15. Uh, For the sake of keeping things short, I'm only going to read from verse 10 to the end, rather than reading the whole chapter, which might uh, 
take a bit more time. But we are going to be exploring uh, particularly the whole chapter of 1 Samuel 15, but also some of those things that come uh, in between 1 Samuel 12 and 1 Samuel 15. But this is what it says from chapter uh, 15 and verse 10. Uh, let's hear God's word. The word of the, of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry, and he cried to the Lord all night. And Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning. And it was told to Samuel, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself, and turned and passed on and went down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be you to the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What then is this bleating of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of oxen that I hear? Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have devoted to destruction. Then Samuel said to Saul, Stop, I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And he said to him, Speak. And Samuel said, Though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go, devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may bow before the Lord. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And Samuel turned to go away, and Saul seized the skirt of his robe and it tore. And Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day, and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have regret. Then he said, I have sinned, yet honour me now before the elders of my people and before Israel, and return with me, that I may bow before the Lord your God. So Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul bowed before the Lord. Then Samuel said, Bring here to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him cheerfully. Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel said, As your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag to pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death. But Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Well, let's pray as we explore God's word together. Let's pray. Lord our God, we praise you and thank you for your word. We ask that you give us hearts this day to understand it, to learn from it, that we may become more and more devoted to Christ because of it. And we ask that you would do this by your spirit working in us, for we ask it in Jesus. Amen. Uh, not an easy chapter, perhaps, uh, 1 Samuel 15, but it's here in God's word 
So we must understand it and we must grapple with it. It's about leadership. I think that is clear. And I think it's about the failed leadership of Saul. And we know what happens when leadership goes wrong, don't we? What happens to the cricket team who has a coach that doesn't lead them well or train them well? Well, they're not much of a cricket team, are they? What happens to a business with a CEO who isn't really invested in the company? The business doesn't do well. In chapter 15, we come to the end of what can only be described, well, it's not quite the end, we're almost at the end, of what can only be described as failed leadership of God's people. It ends the reign of Saul. It ends the time of blessing that God had upon him as king over Israel. And we can see that chapter 15 is about leadership. We're right at the beginning. Uh, the very first thing that Samuel says to Saul in verse 1, which, uh, 1 Samuel 15, he says, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people of Israel. This is about Saul and his kingship. Verse 17, the Lord anointed you king over Israel. And verse 28, at the very end, the Lord has torn the kingdom from Israel from you this day. And we see Saul at that moment clutching in desperation at the robe of Samuel. Trying to preserve whatever credibility and dignity that might be maintained to him. As he pleads with Saul, appear with me before the people, please. It's the desperate end of an ill-suited leader of God's people. I wonder if we've ever seen that happen in our own nation. I wonder if you remember the years of 2007 to 2013 when 2007 Kevin Rudd became our Prime Minister and then in 2010 Julia Gillard became our Prime Minister then in 2013 Kevin Rudd became our Prime Minister then also in 2013 Tony Abbott became our Prime Minister. What a mess. All desperate, all the infighting, all the turmoil, all the desperation to prove they would each do a better job than the last Prime Minister. Trying to clutch onto it by all means possible. Failed leadership is, has nothing to commend itself. Failed leadership of God's people has less than nothing to commend itself. And what God's people really need is a leader that can actually save them. Saul looked good. Don't get me wrong. At the beginning, it, it looked like it was starting well. But the wheels soon came off because he failed to attentively listen to what God had instructed him to do. And the people too, they also failed because they didn't want to listen to God or do what he instructed. What's needed is a better king. A king who will listen and do what God's instructed, one that won't be swayed, even when the people he rules over won't listen and do what's God instructed, even when following God is unpopular, even when it means isolation. That's the king that God's people need. An attentive king who will be intentional in his obedience because that is what will save God's people. Now, there's a couple of things here in 1 Samuel 15 that are confronting and challenging. Of course, the main issue, I think, is the failed leadership of Saul. But that doesn't mean there are other matters that we can just skip over. Because there's a command in 1 Samuel 15 that Samuel gives to Saul. It comes from the Lord. That's clear. And, it's, and, and the command is to destroy completely the people of Amalek. That's what the command is in verse 3 and 4. Go strike Amalek, devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. It comes from God. It's his command that this is what God's people are to do. And then in verses 7 and 8, you read of that slaughter being carried out. Now, to our modern ears, that sounds horrific. I make no mistake, it was. 
So why did God order such an horrific slaughter? Well, the first thing to say is, this is a different historical context from our own time. Uh, if you go back to 1, 1 Samuel 11, the, Amal- the, the Ammonites are attacking God's people. And the Ammonites, and Nahesh their king, says, uh, uh, the people of, 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 of uh The people of Jabesh Gilead say to the the king of the Ammonites, let's make a treaty with you. And Nahesh the king says, that's fine. Happy to do that. One condition, I get to put out the right eyes of each and every one of you. That's the kind of historical context where this is arising from. There's, there's, There's no rule of law. There's no Geneva Convention on the treatment of prisoners of war or, or attacks upon civilians. There's no police protection. There's no Bill of Rights. There's no Charter of Human Rights. It's a brutal world where each nation acted cruelly and callously towards their enemies, especially against those whom they could show superior force. This, so it's a different historical context. We have to bear that in mind. The second thing to bear in mind is God is using his people to dispense his justice upon those who have utterly, fully, and finally rejected him. The Amalekites want nothing to do with God. They have treated God's people with extraordinary wickedness and cruelty. And by this command us all, God is declaring Your time is up. There is no more opportunity. Judgment has come. And the third thing then to say is that this is a picture of what will happen when Christ returns. Let's make no mistake about that. He will come to judge. We are told he will send his angels out to gather all the people together. And those who have rejected him will be cast out to everlasting torment where which scripture says the worm never dies and the fires never cease. It's a picture of the final and full judgment of the Lord Jesus Christ upon all who have rejected him. So this act of slaughter that God sends out his people to accomplish is his judgment upon the wicked who have tormented, tortured and killed his own people. Now, you might think, well, hang on, that's just war, isn't it? People kill other people in war. That's what happens. Why is God getting involved? Well, if you think that God's people don't matter to him, think about another Saul. This is the one from Tarsus, fast forwarding to the uh, the first century, and how he was persecuting, imprisoning and sending to death the early followers of Jesus. What did Jesus say to Saul when he appeared to him? Why are you persecuting me? Well, Saul persecuting Jesus? No, he was persecuting the followers of Jesus. But that's just as bad, says Jesus, as persecuting me. God's people matter to him. And so when God's people are attacked, it is an attack on God. And so here, judges with finality, those who have rejected God, and treated his people wickedly, therefore treated, treating him with wickedness and disdain. So that's the first thing. The next issue in 1 Samuel 15, and we need to give this some attention as well. Verse 11, God says to Samuel, I regret that I've made Saul king. And then in verse 35, we're told again, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. But verse 29, Samuel says... The glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he's not a man that he should have regret. So how do we account these two things together? God's saying to Samuel, I've regretted that I made Saul king. And yet Samuel declaring the glory of Israel does not have regret. How do we put those two things together? Well, I think it's fair to say that God can be grieved, even though he knows beforehand all the actions of his people. God knew beforehand that Saul would fail as king, knew that he would not be an obedient king, knew that there would have to be a better king to take his place. Nonetheless, it grieves him that Saul 
failed to obey him. There's a sense in which God to say, I wanted you to do better, Saul, even though I knew you wouldn't. I think that we we can say that without doing any injustice to God's perfect knowledge of all things. So we can uphold both statements. The Lord regretted. There's a sense of regret. But it's not regret in the same sense that we might mean it. In the sense of, I did something wrong, I'd like to go back and change it. That's not the sense of regret that we're talking about. It's a sense of regret that I knew Saul would fail, even though I wanted him to do better. But it was necessary for my plan. So I hope that helps a little bit about what's going on with that seeming uh, contradiction. It's not a contradiction. It's a seeming contradiction. Uh, So I hope that helps. But let's get to what this chapter is about. It's about leadership and Saul's failure as a leader of God's people. And one characteristic that stands out above all others, it's highlighted again and again, it's, it's, a, it's a characteristic that Saul's lacking. It's a characteristic that a good king should have that, in fact, Saul charged, uh, sorry, Samuel charged the king and his people to have in 1 Samuel 12 is attentive obedience to God's word. I think verses 22 and 23 of 1 Samuel 15 are at the center of 1 Samuel 15. They're highlighted for us. Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, to listen better than the fat of rams, for rebellion is as the sin of divination, presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. And because you have rejected that word of the Lord, he has rejected you from being king. It's as though Samuel is saying, Saul, you can go to the tabernacle. As often as you want, with all the perfect lambs, with all the perfect bulls, sacrifice them. You can do all that. But nothing trumps the desire and the courage that it takes to obey the voice of the Lord. And that's where our chapter 15 begins. Uh, Samuel says to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over Israel. Now, therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. And the last clause of that sentence, it literally translates, listen to the voice of the words of the Lord. Listen to the voice of the words of the Lord. Pay attention, King. Pay attention to what God is saying. Pay close attention to what God is saying so that you make sure you do what God is telling you to do. Because God's not impressed by good intentions. He's not impressed by great victories. He's not impressed by how many people are following Saul. What God wants for his king is for him to listen so that the king will do what God's instructed him to do. And let me say, I don't think that's just something for the king. It's something God wants of all his people. And I think if you go to the New Testament in the book of James, you see that. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. We need to be attentive to God's word so that we might be engaged in doing God's will. It's only through attentive obedience to the word of God that people will be saved. Now, of course, we're not going to restrict God. (laughs) I don't think we should do that. I don't think we can do that. I don't think we're allowed to do that. God is the all-powerful creator of the universe. There are any number of ways he could save his people, except that it must be done in a way that's consistent with his justice. And there's a little example of that in in 1 Samuel 14. There's this little story of the Philistines. They've confiscated all the weaponry from from Israel. Uh, They've confiscated all the blacksmiths. They're not allowed to make any of their own uh, plows even. You know, they have to go down to the the Philistines to get their plows repaired. And so they've confiscated. There's only two swords in all of Israel. Saul has one and his son Jonathan has one. And so Jonathan and his armor bearer uh, go over to this Philistine garrison. And the Philistine have just mustered, we're told, 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and troopers numerous as, as sand on the seashore. And Jonathan and his armor bearer uh, go over to the garrison and they're preparing to attack it. And Jonathan says to his armor bearer, It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. 
Uh, what, what a wonderful trust that Jonathan has in the Lord. And he does trust in the Lord uh, as he and his armor bearer go up and attack this garrison. Sort of serves as a bit of a foil to Saul who doesn't listen to the voice of the Lord. Who isn't trusting in the Lord. There's a pride and arrogance in Saul. We see it in 1 Samuel 15. He's not really interested in obeying the Lord. And that's not, this isn't the first time. In fact, I think if you look at the life of Saul and his reign as king, you'll see that it's a fascinating study in sin. Little justifiable small acts of disobedience. Well, they won't really matter to God, will they? Well, the first time you see it is in uh, 1 Samuel 13. Samuel's delayed in coming to see Saul. The people are beginning to scatter, so Saul takes it into his own hand to preside over the sacrifice and the burnt offering. Why did he do it? It wasn't to please the Lord. It was because the people had started to scatter. It wasn't at the Lord's instructions. The people had started to scatter. He wasn't listening to the Lord. He was doing it because he was afraid that they were abandoning him. King Saul wasn't concerned to do what was right. He was concerned to do what would bring him popularity. What would bring him honour. And so the Lord's instructions, well, they don't matter. But that's okay, isn't it? So long as it was done right. It doesn't matter. Well, was he listening to the word of the Lord? It doesn't seem so. And 1 Samuel 15, coming back to 1 Samuel 15, verse 13, we see a sort of half-truth there from, Sam, uh, from Saul, don't we? As uh, Samuel comes to meet Saul... Uh, Saul says to him, Blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Oh, really, says Samuel? You, you, you've destroyed all the Amalekites and all their livestock. You, you've really done the command of the Lord? Oh, what's this bleating of sheep that I hear? What's this lowing of oxen that I hear? Did you really do all that the Lord commanded, Saul? Oh, no, that's all right, says Saul. No, 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 that, that, that's okay. We kept them so that we could sacrifice them to God. And besides, it's really the people that kept them. It wasn't me. It was the people. I didn't authorize it. It was the people. Well, that's a good thing, isn't it? It doesn't really matter that we didn't do all God said because we're doing it in a better way to better honour the Lord because we know better than God how to honour him. Uh Uh-oh. This is a problem, isn't it? And yet that's what's going on. There's a bit of a hint of a throwback to the Garden of Eden, isn't there? It's not my fault, God. The woman you gave to be with me, she tricked me. Oh, Eve, what did you do? Oh, it's not my fault, God. The snake, the serpent, he tricked me. Isn't that what Saul's doing? It's not my fault. The people, Lord, they kept them. Aren't you king, Saul? Aren't you king? Could you not have stopped them? Oh, there's more evidence regarding Saul's disregard of God and a sense of his own arrogance. Have a look at verse 12. Samuel hears... Uh, from those around him, that Samuel came to Carmel and behold, he set up a monument to himself. Uh, This really gives us an insight into what Saul's all about, doesn't it? It's not about honouring God at all. It's about who is Saul? How can Saul have a legacy for himself? How can Saul remain popular with the people? It's rather remarkable. And even when Saul confronts him, and Samuel, and even when Samuel confronts him, Saul says to Samuel, I have sinned for I have transgressed the commandment of the word, Lord and your words. Why? What does he say? Verse 24. Oh, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. 
That's what it's all about for Saul. It's not about fear of God and attentive obedience to his word at all. It's about remaining popular with the people. And it's about the praise of Saul. And again, verse 19, Samuel confronts Saul and says, Why did you not obey the voice of the Lord? And what does Saul say? I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. It's another half-truth to cover up his failure. Well, what does God say about all that? Verse 23, rebellion is as the sin of divination, presumption as iniquity and idolatry. It does us no good. And God's leaders, it does them no good to think they're doing God's will when they are doing what is popular so that they can curry favour with the people. This is not good leadership amongst God's people. It's as iniquity and idolatry. It's as though you're serving a false god, which, let's be honest, Saul is. He's serving himself. He set himself up as the authority over God, above God, knowing better than God. And it's a problem for God's king. And so we are told, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you from being king. That's the consequence. And I want to emphasize this. As as true as that is for the king of God's people, as those who are God's people brought into his kingdom through the Lord Jesus Christ, through faith in him, we better be paying attention as well. Because we are to be doers of the word as well. That means we must know his word and we must be attentive to his word so that we can live it out. And it's not going to be much good if we say to the Lord, oh, but Lord, I came to the weekly church service. I, I sang the, the songs that praise your name. Isn't that enough? And God's response will be, but what did you do with the rest of the week? What did you do when my word was spoken? Did you listen to it? Did you listen to it so you could act upon it? I think it's timely that, 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 that this is the point that's being emphasised in, in Scripture. We've got the Gideons here today all about God's word and, and sending it out. It's, it's, it's the Reformation. It's the celebration of the, of the Reformation. What were the forum was about? Getting back to Scripture. What the word of God says, not just as an academic exercise, but so we can be attentive to it and then do what it says. That's what the Reformation was all about. And we need a king who will listen to God's word so that he can be the one who executes God's word perfectly. It follows we need a leader, therefore, of God's choice, one who desires in his heart to please God. Saul was all about Saul. He was all about popularity. He set up a monument for himself. When he sees people starting to scuffle, he offers the sacrifice instead of waiting for Samuel. When the people say, hey, there's some really good livestock here, Saul says, go ahead, keep it. It's the best stuff. God won't mind. It's all about popularity with Saul. He doesn't rebuke his people. He doesn't have the courage to say, hang on, God said, no, God said put them to the slaughter. No, he doesn't do any of that. When he is told that the kingdom is going to be taken from him, have a look at what he does. He says to Samuel, come to the sacrifice with me. Why, Saul, why do you want me to go with you? Oh, verse 30, so that I might be honoured before the elders of my people and before Israel. It's all about Saul. Oh, you might be taking the leadership away from me, but don't let me lose face in the sight of the people. It's all about Saul. Very little to do with God. Very little to do with listening to God and obeying God. Saul would rather listen to the people, be in their good books, rather to be in God's corner 
which sometimes means making the tough calls and being unpopular with the people because he's not giving them what they want. God's people need a better king than that. God's people need better leadership than that. Oh, we may well want a leader like Saul. How good would it be if someone just came along and, and, and praised everything we did and said, good on you. I'm glad you weren't. I'm glad you couldn't come to church on Sunday. That was great because you got to be with your family. How good. What about your church family? No, we, we, we need leaders who are going to be attentive to God's word and doers of God's word, even if it means confronting people, if it means confronting popular opinions and confronting popular trends and pushing against it because we're obeying God. In chapter 16, we're going to see the type of leader that God's people need, and it's one who is after God's own heart. But even that leader, as good as he was, we still need better. The point for us here is that those who are appointed leaders of this congregation, the elders and pastors, we must strive to be godly leaders. Strive to be those who aim for listening to God's word with a view to doing God's word, even when it's unpopular, even when it means confronting people, of course with gentleness, but even when it's against current trends. We must be courageous Elders, pastors, we must be courageous. We must be listeners and doers of God's word. But that extends beyond just your elders. Your elders are to be the exemplars of that Christian life. Each of us should be striving for this goal. Listening attentively and doing God's word. And when we have that kind of leadership in the church... Pay attention to them because that's a gift of God to you. It might, it might mean uncomfortable conversations. It might, it might mean you have to realign your own thought patterns and behaviour. But if it's coming from a place where the elders and pastors are listening to and doing God's word and they're confronting you with that, pay attention if they're godly leaders because it's not, they're not pointing you to themselves. They're pointing you back to God and his word. And finally, and quite obviously, where do we find perfect kingly leadership that will listen attentively and actively do the work that God's told him to do? Well, it's found in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's ultimately where all this is headed. The whole kingship scenario in Israel is pointing us to the great king, King Jesus He is our sovereign and our perfect leader. He obeyed God completely, perfectly, we are told, even to the point of obedience to the death on the cross. Philippians 2. The one who by his obedience saved God's people through his perfect obedience to God's word. He is our king and there is none better. All the faults and failings of Saul, well, none of those are present in Jesus. Even as good as David was, he had faults, none of which are present in Jesus. And if you know him as the one who is saved, if you have trusted in him as the one who is saved, then ensure that he is also your Lord, your sovereign. Listen to him and obey him because he shows you what kingly leadership really looks like. Model yourself on him. We talk about following Christ uh, all the time. And the first believers were called the followers of the way. I like that. It's helpful. Because what's one of the distinguishing marks of Jesus' life, if not the most distinguishing mark of Jesus' life? His full and perfect obedience to God. Okay, so follow him. Follow him. That ought to be one of our goals, full obedience to God. And that doesn't matter if you're a pastor, an elder, or a deacon, or or if you're none of those things. If you're trusting in the death and resurrection of Jesus, if he has saved you from your sin, if he has given you the hope of eternal life, then strive to follow him because he sets the example of what obedience to God the Father looks like. 
Now, yes, our pastors and elders and deacons and other leaders in the church, we should be especially attentive to this task. But it sits as a responsibility upon all of us. And that, doesn't, that means we don't get to make excuses for little sins. We don't get to be like Saul. Well, 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 it's okay that we didn't obey the voice of God because we kept the sheep and the oxen for sacrifice. No, we do what God's asked us to do. It's not going to justify us, but it's going to show that we are God's people, already justified through faith in Jesus. It means we turn from our sin. We strive to walk in obedience. It means we don't build monuments to ourselves, trying to create some legacy so that people will remember by our name. I'd shudder to think that there'd be any kind of a plaque or memorial in my name after my time on earth is done. I don't want it. I want it to be about Christ. I want my life to be about Christ. I want my legacy to be about Christ. Because it's for God's glory. And to do anything else is to act in rebellion against God. We need a king, my friends. We need a king. We need leaders. But we need ourselves to be people who are attentive listeners to the word of God. And we need that of kings and leaders in the church. And there is one king who has done it perfectly, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our Lord. He is our sovereign. We should hear him, listen to him, and then do what he's asked us to do and follow him as he shows us by example what perfect obedience looks like. It may be unpopular. It may be uncomfortable. It may challenge the culture of our day. But if we are followers of Christ our King, we will strive to listen. We will strive to obey we will strive to follow his example. I'm going to pray for us. Lord our God, we thank you and praise you for your word to us today. We ask that by your spirit, you would do a work in us, continually transforming us so that we would be active listeners to your word in order to obey your word, knowing that it doesn't bring salvation, but knowing that it is the evidence of our salvation. It is the evidence that we are your people. It is the evidence that the Lord Jesus Christ is king over our lives. Enable us to follow him as the example of perfect, attentive obedience to your word. Oh Lord our God, we need your help in this. For we so frequently stumble and fail. But when we do, call us to repentance, call us to renewal, call us to remember Christ once more, and then equip us and enable us once more to strive for active and attentive obedience. We ask, Father, that you would do these things for us through Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to sing once more, number 246 in your hymn books, Crown Him with many crowns.
Let us hear the blessing of our God. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And God's people said,